Thank you, and uh, it's great to be here. The temptation to talk about not having enough money in human services is great, but I'm actually not going to do that today. But I do want to um, start my presentation by saying that it's my strong belief that in financially straightened times, um, usually we see great innovation. We see innovation in our businesses, in our families, and I hope for us in, in our country. Um, and one of the things that happens, and one of the reasons why I'm keen to speak with you today, is that we need different people involved in finding solutions for some of the challenges that we're going to have uh, for the population of Australia. A couple of weeks ago, I listened to Paul Bloxham's presentation uh, about HSBC's expectations for the Australian economy over the next year or so. And I want to acknowledge I know that there's HSBC reps in the audience and um, I hope that I've done justice to Paul's work. The tone of Paul's presentation was positive. The idea of rebalancing sounded pretty straightforward, much like rebalancing an investment portfolio. Just sell a few things, buy a few things, do things differently. But as I sat there, it didn't resonate for me uh, with what we were seeing at United Care West. And I think partly that's because many of our presentations around our economic and um, uh, economic overviews are usually at quite high levels of abstraction. One of the things that I want to do today is to peel back a couple of those layers for you and let you see what we're seeing at United Care West. Let me set the scene. ABS tells us there's about 900,000 households in Western Australia. That means each quintile is about 180,000. The chart up here shows you the national household income figures released by the ABS in 2015. I'm assuming that these numbers are going to be reasonably representative of our West Australian situation. To interpret it, the median gross annual household income of Q3 is around 80,500. That means that 450,000 households in Western Australia have annual, income, uh, have annual incomes of less than 80,500, or that, that or less, um, which is equivalent to about $1,548 a week. Look at the medium quintile, median of quintile one. That number tells us that 90,000 households in Western Australia have a gross income less than $24,000 or $450 a week. The Q1 median is slightly higher than the single aged pension. Some of those 90,000 households will be living in social housing, although not all of them because we've only got around about 90, uh, 40,000 social housing dwellings in Western Australia. It'll also include some households living in low cost parts of the state. But it's reasonable to conclude that a, a reasonable number of those 90,000 households will be people living in the metropolitan area trying to make men's meet on $450 a week. $450 a week is a real struggle considering that even the cheapest rental properties available will soak up more than 50% of that income. Now let's move to column three. Um, that number uh, der derives from the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre's June 2015 paper on, called Beyond Our Means. I've taken BCEC's household financial asset figure and pulled out the assets that are more liquid, cash, equities, offset accounts, but it doesn't include trust, superannuation or the value of owned properties. Those same low income households have an average liquid assets, given those, that um, formula, of just under $38,000. Remember that figure because this next slide, I just want to um, get you thinking a little bit more deeply. If we actually look at financial assets by quintile, 
the first quintile, or 180,000 households, have an average liquid financial asset of $3,000. That's st a staggeringly low figure. It's one um, unexpected major car repair, a trip to a dentist. Effectively, people are living paycheck to paycheck. But if you remember the uh, previous number and you think about this number, what, what that tells us is that there are a large number of people not in the lowest income quintile who are living or who have assets of $3,000. Because the number is, is, is effectively telling us there are people in all quintiles living paycheck to paycheck. Let's think about employment. We talk fairly easily about rebalancing the employment um, situation. We talk about people moving from full-time to part-time to casual. Um, John gave us some good data on that as part of his introductory speech. We're seeing rebalancing right across um, industries. But we are often susceptible to believing some stereotypes. And one of the stereotypes is that casualisation is mostly in the food service and retail industries. It's actually proving to be not the case anymore. Even in the human services sector, we are seeing our workforce casualised very quickly. But again, I'd like to take you a little bit more deeply into the data and to have a look at a bit more nuanced uh, understanding of what um, our unemployment situation is showing us. Many professionals are moving into what I would call piecework. Fewer people are working in situations that involve predictable salaries, sick leave, annual leave, employer-provided training, all of those additional benefits are no longer part of many people's work experience. More people are doing pieces of work, project work, contract work, subcontract work, work where they're on call or where they're theoretically running a small business. In all of these situations, even if the household receives the same overall level of income, and they may not even be able to predict when that income's coming, their income is likely to be more and more lumpy. As anyone who manages a business with unpredictable or lumpy cash flows, that's a very tough gig. One of the things UCW knows from experience is that lumpy or unpredictable income makes it really hard for households to interact with a social safety net. Income support and other benefits tend to have on and off switches, and they tend to have waiting periods. In reality, many houses, households cycle through quite short periods of needing more help or needing less help. But the way things like Newstart or even the age pension is set up, um, they, that leaves people either very short of money or with debts to Centrelink, both of which are very difficult to manage. So what's going on in our communities? Effectively, the population is increasingly made up of people who have got low cash, high debt, and un unpredictable and lumpy income. Not the majority, but an increasing number of people. Our experience at United Care West is that if you are in that situation when things go wrong, and they do go wrong, they go wrong fast, six weeks, three paychecks, if you've just lost your job, or if you've had a redundancy, you probably last six months. They go wrong very badly. They can be very catastrophic. We're seeing ra increased suicide, increased uh, domestic violence. We're seeing a whole range of social um, uh, impacts from changing stressful situations for families. And our experience is that they stay wrong longer. So for every... Um, uh, it, it, what we're finding is that about, it takes about three times as long to get out of a situation as it took to get in. 
arguably if you had six months of unemployment, it will take you 18 months to get out of the financial situation that you find yourself in. It does get better, but it's really important that people of your uh, influence in our community understand the next layer down um, so that you can make informed judgments. There is a view in Australia that everyone goes to government first when they get into trouble. Business, individuals, that's not our experience. What we find is many people, almost everybody, tries to sort things out for themselves, whether it's a business or an individual. These days, that means for most people, finding money within the household to top up or buy additional supports or services. I'm sure anyone in this audience with family members in aged care, children or grandchildren in childcare, young people coming out of university and needing help getting their first job or trying to buy new, their first home will attest to the fact that these days there is a lot of pressure on the family system to actually try and resolve um, the first flush of what's going on. Historically, um, when the family and the community uh, the family couldn't cope or couldn't meet all the needs, um, we as a community responded. We did it through charitable assistance or self-help groups. Today, this is a really confused space in Australia. Traditional charities have become social enterprises, and new small and small trusts and charities are being established at a rate of knots. The Australian government policy around how the government's involved is much clearer. The idea of a traditional income safety net, in my view, no longer exists. People needing assistance are either deemed to be part of the working community or they're not. And these changes have been relatively new, um, so the impact's not yet clear as to what's going to happen in our community as a result of them. However, government purchasing of services on behalf of eligible citizens has resulted in the establishment of a range of markets in the human services. We now have marketised childcare, employment services, correction services, aged care services, disability services. Housing is an interesting part of the market engagement with meeting people's needs because 30 years ago, um, in most jurisdictions, um, we determined that we were going to rely on the housing market to solve the needs of our population for housing. This table describes some significant changes in Australia's housing market. In the immediate post-war period, our construction rate significantly exceeded our rate of population growth. These days, it's just slightly under our population growth. Immediately post-war, governments built a lot of houses themselves, around 15,500 a year on average, and these days that number is significantly less. Immediately post-war, our home ownership rate increased significantly and then hovered around 70% for most of the last quarter of the 20th century. It's now lower overall, and the rates of home ownership have decreased markedly among the younger age cohort. So when you look at the policy environment that has been uh, part of shaping this um, outcome, we know that in the 80s we moved money out of social housing investment and into Commonwealth rent assistance. We brought in negative gearing and around the turn of the 20th to the 21st century we brought in capital gains tax exemptions and the non-eligibility first homeowner um, grant. Governments have stopped investing directly in housing and have instead poured money into trying to shape the market to provide enough rental properties and to encourage home ownership. There are two points about this that I want to bring to your attention. Firstly, investing in this strategy has resulted, I believe, in some substantial, significant, unintended consequences. Arguably, the result that we've got is the opposite of what these policies were intended to achieve. We're not building enough houses. Many Australian rental markets are unaffordable and home ownership rates are lower than they were, especially among the young. And secondly, once you nudge a market in a particular direction, it's very difficult to unnudge it. However poorly our current housing policy settings may be serving us, as a community, politically and economically, 
it's become even clearer probably even today that it's going to be pretty hard to change any of those policy settings for any government. So relying on market solutions for service responses to people's needs is, is a, certainly an option. However, as with any market, understanding the unintended consequences is critical if we're going to avoid market failure because market failure in human services will lead to an Australia that few of us in this room have ever lived through. These are our expectations for 2016. Final slide, so I think I should be okay. We're going to see more people needing help, um, and particularly food. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm very happy to do an advertisement for food rescue support in a second. Community is going to need different supports. We're going to need financial literacy training as well as financial counselling. We're going to have to figure out what the role of not-for-profits are and voluntary supports. Um, and we're also going to have to in ensure that the ICT connection for people who are um, living uh, without sufficient resources is actually maintained, otherwise they will be totally excluded. And then government's got to make careful choices with regards to marketisation. A final few thoughts. Australia has more than, and Western Australia in particular, has more than 60% of the population doing very well, or reasonably well. But changing work patterns may change that quickly, depending on global economic factors and national policy responses. The WA economy needs more than 60% of the population doing OK if it's going to positively rebalance. The Australian response to social need, our welfare system, one of the key reform drivers uh, for CEDA, was set up when most people had predictable income. Any welfare reform has to be undertaken in the context of our current and future economic drivers. Reform is possible. Marketisation is an option. But if we don't understand that we are fundamentally dealing with people, not widgets, we may end up with unintended consequences that we've not been prepared for. And as I close, I want to leave you with a challenge. As you and your businesses make your decisions, are you pushing hard to do the hard thing? Serving the 60% is straightforward. But pushing in further into trying to ensure that you and your businesses are making a positive contribution to the well-being of the community is the hard thing. But we're going to need you to do it. Thank you.